All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's discussion about new opportunities to automate business writing using natural language generation software. Before we start, I wanted to ask that we pause and travel back in time to 1886, when the French author Auguste Villiers de Lille Adam published a science fiction novel called Tomorrow's Eve. For any trivia lovers out there, the novel's main claim to fame is that it was the first book to popularize the term android, as its plot focuses on a woman machine that a fictionalized Thomas Edison makes to replace his friend's beautiful but somewhat soulless girlfriend. But trivia aside, I mention the work because it contains a quote that captures the essence of our discussion. The quote reads, every human occupation has its repertoire of stock phrases within which every man twists and turns until his death. His vocabulary, which seems so lavish, reduces itself to a hundred routine formulas at most, which he repeats over and over. Returning to the 20th century, I'm sure we can all think about, excuse me, 21st century, I'm sure we can all think about business communications or reports we write regularly whose language and structure would fit the bill as one of those hundred routine formulas we repeat time and again. These might be P&L statements for a line of business or marketing emails we send out to prospects. They might be survey results, product descriptions, or compliance reports. All these types of writing share a key trait. The data backing the details vary with time, and context, but the underlying structure and form stays static over a relatively long period of time. And when a task stays consistent, we can start to create ways to do it faster using automation. Today's discussion will focus on how natural language generation enables companies to automate certain types of business writing, as well as personalized communications at scales only possible using automation. I'm delighted to be joined today by two fantastic panelists. Robbie Allen is the founder and CEO of Automated Insights, a natural language generation software provider. Robbie drives the company's strategic vision, oversees engineering and research, and ensures the company continues to be named best place to work in the Raleigh-Durham area. Robbie started writing code to automate the writing process while working at Cisco. He has two engineering master's degrees from MIT and has authored or co-authored 10 books about enterprise software and software development. Joining Robbie is Hillary Mason, who's just joined us, the founder and CEO of Fast Forward Labs, a machine intelligence research company, and data science and residence at Excel Partners. Previously, Hillary was chief scientist at Fitly, a social media analytics company. She co-hosts a Data Gotham, a conference for New York's homegrown data community, and co-founded Hack New York, a nonprofit that helps engineering students find opportunities in New York's creative technical economy. Hillary served on Mayor Bloomberg's technical technology advisory board and is a member of Brooklyn Hacker Collective, NYC Resistor. She can also tell you where to get the best cheeseburger in New York City. I know that from experience. And my name is Catherine Hume. I lead sales and marketing efforts for Fast Forward Labs, and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's discussion. We're going to plan to talk about five different topics, exploring how natural language generation works, how companies are using it today, and where we think future opportunities lie. Please feel free to post questions throughout the web webinar on the GoToMeeting chat box or on Twitter using the NLG webinar hashtag. You can see it at the bottom of the slides throughout. You can also save your questions to pose them to Hillary or, Hillary or Robbie live during the Q&A following the presentation and discussion. And with that, I'm going to turn and begin our conversation. So Hillary, um, I'm actually going to start with you. Great. Uh, we worked on a natural language generation report back in 2014. It was one of the first reports here at Fast Forward Labs. And why don't you start by explaining the basics of how natural language generation algorithms work? Yeah, so what we do at Fast Forward Labs is do um, a deep research dive into each topic. So it's not just a report. It's not a piece of paper. What we do is actually build a working implementation of every technology we explore. And I believe we'll talk about that a bit later. So we actually built our own NLG system um, and then uh, also wrote an overview that's uh, easy to understand at the conceptual level, but also has technical details about how this stuff works. And essentially what NLG does, or natural language generation, is it takes some structured data and outputs narrative or language that represents that data. And the example we have up on the slide here is a really easy one for us all to understand. It's weather. So you can see that it goes from structured weather data, things like temperature, wind speed, 
um, to a model of distributions of uh, you know what is meaningful in that data. You don't care about rain if it's not going to rain. You only want to know if it is going to rain. And then it shows how you might translate those numbers into language. Cool. Um, Robbie, you guys have built multiple systems, multiple vers versions of your Wordsmith platform using this basic underlying technology. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the practical applications that you're seeing in the market using NLG? Yeah, great question. Um, back in 2010, when we first went to market, um, you know, I, I predicted that the applications of this primarily were in the sort of media space, things like sports, finance, uh, maybe real estate. Um, but we kind of hit a perfect tide of big data really becoming um, of, of great importance to lots of industries. And so every time I make statements about you know which industries NLG applies to, then we inevitably the, the next day or next week we'll get some inquiries about some crazy application that I never would have thought of. And so fundamentally now I don't limit um, what the possible applications are. I can tell you some of the things that we've done um, you know over the, the last five years. Uh, I mentioned before, obviously, sports, uh, you know, finance, those, those have um, obvious implications, mostly because there's lots of structured data, um, you know, as Hillary kind of hit on before, you have to have a lot of data to really drive good narrative. Um, but again, as big data has proliferated enterprises and it's become uh, much more accessible in lots of different industries, you know, we're finding applications um, internal, such as, you know, various types of BI applications, whether it's sales reporting, um, you know, then there's all sorts of interesting external things. We're working on a, with a variety of e-commerce companies to automate product descriptions using data. Um, and then obviously in sports, as I mentioned before, we've done some intriguing things with like Yahoo and the NFL to automate fantasy football recaps. And so really there's applications across a variety of industries and fundamentally anybody that's trying to communicate insights with data. Uh, typically you're using some sort of dashboard of visual, visualization today, we can help augment or even replace those using narrative with our technology. So Hillary, you mentioned uh, when you gave us the brief overview in the beginning that at Force Fire Labs we build prototypes to demonstrate to our, our clients um, how the technology actually functions. So tell us a little bit about the prototype that we built for natural language generation. Sure. So we looked at applications, again, where you could take this kind of structured data and you could turn it into narrative. And we wanted something that was something that everybody has experience with. So we decided to do a prototype around real estate. Also, it was something that, uh, that no one else had really done before in that particular domain. So it was uh, something where we thought we could show off a, a few unique capabilities and then also um, use it mainly as a tool, as with all of our prototypes, to demonstrate to people how the thing works. So you can see on the left side of the screenshot here, you have the structured data describing, um, in this case, a New York City apartment. Things like number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, specific amenities that may be available or not available. And then on the right side, what you're looking at is uh, in the background, the generative model will generate many candidate texts for uh, meeting the criteria specified by the data. And then we have a scoring function that'll just rank them. And so you'll see highlighted in white there, the black text is the best scoring uh, things generated by the system so far in this particular example. And real estate is a lot of fun because we all understand it. We all, you know, want somewhere to live that's uh, that's comfortable. And at least if you live in New York, it's a pretty competitive market. So you have a lot of experience reading these sorts of ads. Um, and it's a lot of fun to sort of play with the levers here and see, you know, oh, what if I ask for something that's completely irrational, like an eight-bedroom apartment with one bathroom? Um, what does it do then? Uh, and so we built this to give people a really good idea of of uh, how the system works, what it does. We also share the code with our clients, of course, so they can actually take a look and poke around it, with it. Um, another thing that might be fun to mention is that when we were building this prototype, we didn't start with the idea of using real estate data. We actually played with a bunch of different data sets. Um, one of them was restaurant reviews, and we were actually able to generate realistic restaurant reviews off of structured data about the restaurant, so type of cuisine, you know, uh, general location, price point, kinds of things on the menu, but then we couldn't think of a non-evil thing to do with that prototype. At least with this real estate ad generator, you could imagine it actually being useful. 
with a restaurant review writer, it's uh, it's just purely you know spam or something like that. So we ended up using real estate for that reason. Robbie, how about you? Are you seeing um, lots of uptake in the real estate industry for Wordsmith as well? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's um, you know potentially you know probably one of the um, most requested uh, industries that that we hear from. Cool. So Hillary, back to you. Um, there's a lot of interest these days and a lot of talk about machine intelligence or artificial intelligence or machine learning, right? So there's a lot of there's a lot of terms that are being thrown around that are just on the threshold of being understood by people across the business community. Where does natural language generation fit within this larger machine intelligence landscape? Um, so machine intelligence is a wonderful way to sort of build an umbrella over what we might call AI, machine learning, algorithms, data science at the moment, meaning it, it has very little specific meaning. Artificial intelligence is a field of computer science research with a rich history, um, and, and it does mean a, a sort of specific domain of algorithms, and in many ways a specific way of looking at the world, and machine learning is, inherits from that, so it is also a field of computer science. Um, when we talk about something like natural language generation, what we're talking about is a family of machine learning or AI algorithms that can be used to have this language generation capability. And I see you've put up one of my favorite jokes on the slide here, which is AI is whatever a computer can't do today, which is always the joke. Because, um, you know, historically computers could never play chess, and that was the great, the great uh, you know, goal of AI. But uh, in 1997, Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov, and then we needed a new goal, and now computers can drive cars. So I think we're doing pretty well. So um, one of the things also when one thinks about AI and it, as its distinction as a field of research in computer science from other more deterministic models, we think often about any algorithm, al algorithmic systems as being rules-based um, and just executing the same recipe time and again on a given process. And it seems like these days, some of the machine learning algorithms are moving more towards creativity. So what, what exactly is the distinction between those two types of programming paradigms? And where does NLG fit on that spectrum? So it's not real creativity. We have to be very clear about this. These algorithms are not going to write you know, prize-winning novels with no input data. And there's no true creativity here. Uh, what we have seen instead is a shift from um, more rules-based modeling to more statistical modeling, where you are instead exploring a probability space. Um, and most of the NLG algorithms that are used today are, in fact, probabilistic algorithms in the sense that they are not necessarily deterministic. Um, and so, but what's interesting here is that they give the appearance of creativity. So they may ingest a huge amount of source data and they can output something that looks uh, like a coherent sentence. It is a coherent sentence, and that's something that, uh, that it, it didn't just make up. It's not, not itself aware in any sense, but it is able from that distribution of training data and the rules that it's given and the, the code that runs the system to sort of generate something that appears to be creative. Um, and may appear to be unique. And when you're generating an advertisement text for a unique property, it's not going to be the same as what's generated for a different property. This is something that was traditionally a little bit harder to do. Um, and this is happening now for a variety of reasons, largely because the data is available to actually make these algorithms and systems viable. We can afford the storage space and the computational power we need to run them. Um, and we can run them for things that would previously have seemed entirely frivolous. So you might think that, um, you know, writing automated summaries of fantasy sports games is super cool. You would never have paid enough human beings to actually do that. But now that you have this capability in software, uh, it just makes so much sense to be using it for that. So, Robbie, I, I'd like to have you develop what Hillary just said there, right? So thinking about um, the, the possibility of executing tasks like automating summaries for fantasy sports games, which was one of the original use cases of Wordsmith, or what became Wordsmith. Um, you wrote a fascinating piece in thinking about the type of writing that NLG makes possible on Medium recently. Can you tell us a little bit about what the argument of that piece was? Yeah, sure. So as I kind of thought about what is, you know, our platform Wordsmith, you know, how is it really different than what's come before um, you know, I really started thinking about the writing process in general. So I, I've done a lot of writing, um, 
and if you look at the tools that writers have today in writing of any type, whether it's creative or um, you know corporate writing or, or any other type, um, you know the tools that we have today are not much different <clears throat> than what we had 10 years ago, even 20 years ago. Um, you know, there's word processors and there's things like Word and other um, you know mechanisms to, to write out content. But again, the, the manner in which you do that is largely the same. It's sentence by sentence and um, that process hasn't changed. The main innovation around writing and, and sort of communication in general has been the distribution of content. And so those are things like Twitter and Facebook and, and other forms to, to help get the word out. It's not really changed the way in which we've written necessarily. But with Wordsmith, I really think it's, a, it's an innovation in a space that has needed innovation for, for quite some time. So instead of thinking about write, sitting down and writing out one story, um, Wordsmith gives you a platform to help you structure um, output that won't you know, essentially be one story, but could be tens of stories, hundreds of stories, maybe even thousands of stories. And the process to, that you go about doing that is fundamentally different than the traditional sitting down and writing out one sentence after another. Um, so I, I do think it, it's going to be, you know, it's, it's a new way of writing that hasn't really been present before, and I think it's going to enable all sorts of capabilities. And frankly, that's to me the most exciting part are the things that weren't possible before because, you know, people had to write one sentence after another, and the ability to scale that out was very limited. Wordsmith provides a tool set to help you um, create a scalable type of communication that just wasn't possible before. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. I also think when one pushes into the practical implications of then implementing NLG systems in production and companies and the types of skills that those working in marketing departments, those working in finance departments that are doing P&L statements for the company might come to develop, right? So they're not going to be, you know, developing traditional skills where it's, it's writing sentence by sentence, but really having a, a lightweight version of the skills that a data scientist might have today and thinking about how to use data to then modify the way in which those insights from data are presented to the to the world. Robbie, let's stick with you. Um, there's a lot of discussions these days about natural language generation within the business intelligence landscape. And traditionally, when one thought about BI, we think about data visualization pr providers that will take, you know, uh, discrete data points that, that are in the traditional tools and then develop visuals um, to help stakeholders understand insights that are within the data. Where does NLG fit in the space? Why is it so popular suddenly within BI and what's the, um, what's the give and take between visualization and narrative? Yeah, it's funny how these things, um, you know, take a while to develop and then, you know, classically an overnight success. Uh, I went out to the BI companies in 2010 and 11 saying that the future of business intelligence communication is going to be through narrative, not just through visualization. And no one really bought it at the time, but now, you know, we're starting to see more people interested in that. And the main reason is I spent a good 10 years of my career building dashboards, you know, using BI tools, developing visualizations. And while they, you know, absolutely can, can serve a need and they can help a certain subset of the population that need to understand what's going on in the data, the problem is uh, there's a lot of people that don't understand visualizations well or they're very difficult to understand. And so a narrative gets people out of the business of having to interpret the results, right? Visualizations require anybody that's looking at it to do an interpretation of, of the visualization. And, and that's good, again, for a subset of people, but there's a much larger population of people that just want to understand what's going on in the data. And oftentimes visualizations don't do a great job of communicating that. In fact, there's a whole class of insights that you can't even really communicate with visualizations or, you know, you have to understand the X and Y axis really well, the colors, the lines, the bars. There's just a lot going on for a person to interpret. The great thing about a narrative is, you know, it's language. It's what people have grown up with. You know, it's what they speak, and so they have a much better um, understanding of, of what it is that you're trying to communicate. There's also things that you can communicate in narrative that, like I mentioned, are very difficult in, in a, a visualization. For example, I think the example we have on the slide is you had a <clears throat> strong quarter to compare to last year, but you missed a few key opportunities. Now, to communicate that in a set of visualizations would require, you know, lots of visualizations, probably some tables. Um, you know, you'd have to go through and do a lot of interpretation to be able to pull out a simple insight that you can express succinctly via narrative. And again, I think that kind of highlights some of the benefit. And I want to make it clear, I'm not saying it's an either-or scenario. In fact, almost, you know, I think just about every one of our implementations 
have combined the two together. So you lead with the narrative to help tell a story and you provide visualizations for the folks that want to do additional interpretation on their own. But again, I think for too long we've only had visualizations as an option and now with a platform like Wordsmith, we'll also have narrative plus visualizations to help tell a better story. Hillary, just following up on that, uh, in our thinking about natural language generation and some of the text that we put into the report, we say that one of the breakthroughs here is that the machines are starting to communicate with us on our own terms, namely in natural language. Um, in your experience helping companies with data science projects, have you found that it, this, these technologies also provide that same value of democratization of insights and just rendering things more easily interpretable across different business stakeholders? Sure, and in, in that same report we had a diagram that shows, you know, a spreadsheet of numbers and then it shows a graph derived from those numbers and then it shows, you know, a sentence interpreting that graph and just as Robbie said, there's actually, we, we've taken it for granted for a really long time, but there's a lot of hard cognitive work to do in uh, looking at a graph and understanding what it tells you about the world and then making a decision based on that graph. And I'm sure you can ask every data scientist I know if they've ever been in a meeting where everyone has looked at a graph and come up with a different theory about it. Um, and there are a lot of reasons why that happens. Um, but when you start to bring in this ability to have text that interprets the graph, it sort of brings people to a, a common space and it allows people to have a similar foundation to use um, sort of as that basis for what they're going to be making decisions based on. Uh, so it should be thought of as an a, additional tool uh, sort of in the set of tools that you can use to make data more pervasive inside of an organization. Robbie, there's a question that came in that relates to the use of natural language generation in the field of journalism and thinking about the ethics of these technologies. So I'm going to step back and think about some of the earlier applications for Wordsmith in Yahoo for the fantasy football reporting and then also in the Associated Press for um, company earnings reports. Um, What's the impact that you've seen on these professions and how does the company think about sort of the give and take between the product and those that are using it? Yeah, that's a great question. In fact, you know, this comes up pretty frequently with our Associated Press implementation. So for them, what we, we help them do is, you know, traditionally once a quarter, you know, they would create an earnings report for a company. And they would do that for around 300 companies a quarter because that's, you know, all that they could really staff and, and still be, um, you know, profitable kind of generating earnings reports. We told them that you know that's a great application of, of NLG, and so we helped them go from 300 companies covered a quarter to 3,000. And you know it's they've seen, in fact, that what they've seen is more feedback from the local, um, you know, press outlets and the you know small towns that are now actually having their local companies covered. So it's actually increased business for the AP as a result. Um, and sometimes the question comes up: Well, what happens if you know who's to say what? automated insights right is correct or you know are there ethical concerns for me you know ultimately especially with an implementation like the AP where it's so um, public and you see so many different versions come out or you see you know the same kind of story that we're producing quarter after quarter you know there's not going to be a ton of variability or you know the robot doesn't wake up on the wrong side of the bed and decides to go off on a company because they didn't like a particular company right it's it's going to be the same type of journalistic approach every single company, every single quarter. Um, and so it's a much more predictable type of story that's, that's going to be coming out. And for things like earnings report, that's what you want. Now, you don't want that for everything. You know, the coverage of the snowstorm on the, you know, on the northeast. You know, those are the types of things where, you know, it's a different type of reporting. And you wouldn't necessarily want a, a robot covering that on a day-in and day-out basis. But, you know, that's something that maybe you'd want more of a human touch. But for lots of applications, especially data-driven ones, um, you know, we found that NLG really helps media organizations scale their opportunity in a way that they just weren't able to do with people. Yeah, I think that's right. So just commenting on how the software is structured so that there's certain types of writing um, that, that requires consistency, is driven by data sites, data data insights and basically just articulates the relationships between that data and then there's others that other types of writing that will remain more creative um, and for that reason 
probably won't be automated using tools like this for a really long time. So it just sort of shifts around the, the works and process, workflows and processes internally, but doesn't necessarily um, get rid of journalists anytime soon. Well, and the one point I'd make on this, especially when we first launched with the AP, because that really garnered a lot of uh, publicity and attention, and people, you know, would write articles that it's the end of journalism. And if you think about it, you know, for any given story, there's lots and lots of people writing about that story, right? And so, to me, it, it's kind of funny to think that just because there's an automated approach to say earnings coverage, that doesn't mean that's going to be the only earnings coverage, right? It, when Google announces earnings, it's not that our story is going to be the only one and now everybody should just go home and there's never going to be another story. There's all sorts of perspectives that you can apply and some of those may be automated, others that may not, but it doesn't mean that now everybody should just stop writing about the subject simply because one version of the story has been automated. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, let's shift gears a little bit and go into not, not the types of stories and, and articles that one can write using these tools, but what it, what it means for a company to go ahead and implement one. So, Robbie, historically, when a company uh, bought WordSmith and went through the process of implementing it, it, it required some time with the professional services team to work with the data, um, build out templates that would then serve for future composition, and basically get the system up and running so that it was able to, um, to generate text in the style that the company liked to have. You guys have just released a new self-service platform of WordSmith that shifts around the parameters of this process a bit. Can you tell us a little bit about, uh, about the new WordSmith and its capabilities? Yeah, absolutely. So when we first got started, we, we mostly focused on um, you know, the, the more complex narratives, you know, the stories that you know, they needed to, you know, especially to work at scale. So again, the fantasy football one's a good one. You know, there's literally several million fantasy football recaps that we have to produce every week. And, to be able to do that on a week by week basis over the course of a season, you know, there's a certain amount of variability that's expected. Um, you know, even in the case of, of the AP, you know, that's coming out every quarter. It's getting, you know, a lot of attention. So there's a certain level of complexity and variability that's needed there. But we started to get more and more feedback from our customers that that wasn't, you know, always the, the case. That there's lots of use cases where they had, you know, more simplified data sets or the needs for the narrative were more simple. And so could we just provide them access to the platform so that they could go build it themselves as opposed to engaging with us and essentially have us doing all the heavy lifting. And so after several years of going through, you know, having lots of clients, and last year we generated over a billion stories with, with WordSmith, we, I felt we were at a point where we could actually have something um, that we could make available to a larger group of people. Um, and mostly that consisted of cre creating a more simplified approach. So the platform that we use internally that generated the, you know, over a billion stories in a year, you know, that contains lots of bells and whistles. It has lots of, um, you know, more sort of what you might consider artificial intelligence built into it versus WordSmith, which is initially a tool to help people, again, with fairly straightforward data sets, create fairly straightforward narratives. And so the process that you go through um, is, you know, just, simple three steps, you upload data. Again, we, right now we're assuming you can, you know, provide the data in a CSV format, so in a, whether it's Excel or some other way to, to get it in a comma separated value format, or you can use our API. We also have an API. And then from there you design a template, um, and it works in a very sort of rules-based um, approach. And again, this doesn't have, you know, all the bells and whistles that um, you know, we wanted to add simply because this can, NLG can get very complicated very quickly. And so initially we're trying to create something that is um, relatively straightforward for any business user to use. And so we're trying to, to really kind of focus on the user experience and making it so that people can, you know, create narratives that, again, don't have to go out to millions of people a week, but maybe they're sending it out to dozens a week. And it has all the sort of features and capabilities that, that you might expect it, it having. And then once you've designed that story, then you essentially can start generating um, output from that using your data. Excellent. Um, Hillary, I'd like to shift over to back to Robo Realtor. So in this approach, if we go back to the slide in the, in the section where one is designing the article, basically the end user is going to come in and define a set of rules to affiliate language with the quantitative relationships in the data. 
we took a really different approach in designing Robo Realtor, where it wasn't the end user who comes in and sets these rules, but you actually started with existing language. Um, so returning to your uh, original point that one of the breakthroughs and, and changes that have made some of these new technologies possible is that there's a lot more data that we can use to generate systems. So tell us how Robo Realtor works, why it's different, and then some things that companies should keep in mind when they're trying to think about the different approaches. Um, so it's actually not a different approach. It just adds an additional step. So here you have a human sort of playing Mad Libs, so writing the template for what the story can look like and where the data can plug in and maybe when to use which sentence and when to use another sentence based on what the data looks like. We do explore this fully in our reports. This is the template approach. Um, it requires a lot of setup time from a person who actually has the domain knowledge to make good decisions about interpreting the data. Um, our approach basically automated that piece, and we did that by taking a corpus of tens of thousands of uh, real estate listings in this case, um, and correlated that to the structured data that appears in the, the example sentences. And then we had our system construct those templates um, and those potential sentences automatically. The second piece is identical, though, where you actually look at the input data and generate the outcome. Um, and this is because, uh, you know, it's, it's fine to sort of, you know, manually construct the stories, but when I look ahead about and think about where this is going to go, it's not going to necessarily stay there. I think the most interesting applications are going to be ones where the system can automatically learn what those templates can be, and then even dynamically as the system is used can personalize or update those templates. We didn't quite get to that in our prototype last year, maybe next time. So we've got um, Mechanical Turk here on this slide as well. Where does that play a role? Um, Mechanical Turk is a uh, service Amazon provides to have human beings sort of, uh, you know, generate sentences. Um, if you don't have an existing corpus of data or can't create one, I suppose you could use Mechanical Turk to generate one. Though there, there's always some complication in using Turk for this stuff. The other thing you could do is, um, in our case, we parsed each sentence um, using a, a fairly standard parsing scheme, um, which is another little bit of, of an algorithm that's sort of interesting. Um, but if it was in some way language that was very difficult to parse statistically, you could probably have Turk do the parsing for you as well. Um, and this is generally just a thing where if you need to plug in relatively cheap human labor into a process like this where you've got not millions, but maybe 10,000 examples you're working on. It's something that's actually affordable and helping people do this more effectively. Cool. Um, I do want to be clear, we didn't use Mechanical Turk at all in our project, though. Yeah, so just an option for companies who are trying to, if they do want to take this um, this template-based approach, uh, they an option to go and find some data if you're not able to scrape an existing data set. Um, Robbie, coming back to you. Go back to applications, returning to the beginning of, the beginning of our conversation. What are um, some industries that you're seeing are adopting new NLG technologies and, and the new uh, self-service version of WordSmith? Yeah, I mentioned earlier that uh, you know e-commerce has had a strong interest um, in, in NLG. You know, especially industries where um, you know one of two things: either they have to pay freelancers to create content repetitively. Um, you know, again, those kind of apply to you know e-commerce for product descriptions, um, you know, the hotel industry for hotel descriptions, things of that nature, where the cost to create content is pretty high. Um, the second opportunity, and this one's a little harder to break because it requires um, you know people to kind of think outside of the box than what they're traditionally used to, and that's in sort of mass personalization at scale. And so. And we have portfolio summary um, up here. That's one example. Fantasy football recaps that we've talked about before are another one where traditionally people wouldn't have thought about creating content that's personalized at the individual level because it would have been way too expensive. But now with NLG, you can create these kind of reports um, at scale and it still be very cost effective. And so that's a you know, huge opportunity that we're only just kind of beginning to see um, you know, early progress in. Um, let's see. Next, real estate descriptions. So Hillary's talked quite a bit about that. You know, again, that's an area that uh, you know we continue to get um, you know a lot of inbound interest, and we've worked with companies like um, HomeSnap and others where we're doing 
you know, not only listing automation, but even neighborhood description automation, market description automation, those type of things. Um, cell summaries, you know, in the BI space specifically, that's a, a, a really fruitful area because, you know, in the sales world, it's not uncommon to pass around the, the weekly or monthly spreadsheet that contains, you know, all the sales staff's numbers and, you know, it's up to them to kind of interpret and understand it. We can really boil that down into a way that's, um, you know, understandable and, and people really get. So those are just a few examples. You know, one quick antidote, when we launched our beta for WordSmith, uh, the request form uh, for the industry that you're in contained 42 options. And so when you filled out the form, you had to select the industry you're in. Within a week, all 42 industries had been selected. And this that includes things like nonprofits and um, education, all sorts of areas. And so, um, you know, clearly there's no sort of shortage of opportunity in this space. Yeah, that's really awesome. The other thing that I've always found striking about the sales reporting or internal BI use cases is that uh, it, it also fuses with personalization. So we think about personalization often in um, large marketing communications at scale or the portfolio management commentary that you mentioned earlier on. But even internal in an organization, what the CEO, the you know the the CMR head of sales, the regional directors, and then the field team care about, right? The, the the insights from the data that actually matter to them with regards to how they're going to structure their activities um, differ, right? So um, personalization isn't only something that that applies to uh, the large, you know, the millions of consumers in an e-commerce space, but actually also has relevance internal to, to companies as well. Um, Hillary, uh, last question. So in our reports, we always like to include a section that's thinking about the future. Where is this technology going to go in the next two to five years? What's the future of NLG? Yeah, I mean, well, I won't, uh, I won't promise that all of these things will come true, but it is an area that's, uh, that I think is pretty exciting and it's changing pretty rapidly. And even since we wrote our initial um, natural language generation pass, um, we started to see some changes in the way people are approaching these problems with the introduction of neural network methods, which we're actually exploring in our newest report, um, particularly with regards to summarization. Um, and it, that's super exciting. So what, what I expect to see is, in fact, that uh, you know we will see NLG systems that create um, more coherent summaries. The domains will expand. So you start to see these things sort of uh, be created in very specific applications. So first, real estate ads, that's it. But then perhaps, you know, it might sort of expand out from there. Um, and we'll start to see things like, uh, oh, I see you have our, our early prototype of a summarization system up here. Um, summaries that can be created that include words that never appear in the underlying corpus because instead of um, just sort of taking a template-based model, we're actually dynamically adapting those templates based on mathematical representations of language. And if people are interested in looking into this stuff, I'd suggest you look at some stuff in the open source community, particularly the word to vec project that Google released. Um, but in the longer term, I really think the exciting stuff in NLG is around uh, personalized uh, language generation to interpret complex data. So something is happening in your world that's very, um, very quantitative. Maybe it's weather. Maybe it's you know your performance on some task. Um, maybe it's some new event that's happening, you know, out in the world, and it happens to be something you know a lot about. So the system can adapt it and send you, oh, here's a sentence giving you the update on what's going on. Um, whereas if someone else were a little more naive on the topic, it would give them the appropriate background they need to understand and make whatever decision is in front of them now based on that changing world. Um, so I think there's a, there's a lot of exciting stuff still ahead here. How about you, Ravi? Any uh, future imminent plans for the Automated Insights team in the NLG space? Absolutely. So again, what, we were, what we're showing in WordSmith today is just kind of the very early stages of where the tool is going. Again, we what we've built up over the last five years actually includes some of the stuff that Hillary was talking about. But again, um, you know, it can be complex to show visually to sort of typical business users, and so we're trying to ease into this process a little bit. You know, already, um, you know, we're seeing some good inroads with what we have, and so what you'll be seeing from us over time is what I like to call some of the magic behind this. Um, and it'll be things that, you know, you won't even have to interact with, 
they'll just be suggestions that automatically come up based on the things that you're already writing about. Or you know, there'll be um, you know text options for you to that you know there's a certain data variable or, or column in your spreadsheet, and we'll give you ideas of things that you could write about. Um, that plus also helping people really sort of understand. Um, the type of content they're generating. If you think about, for example, the, the QA process when you're generating thousands of stories, it's much different than if you're just trying to edit one story. And so there's a lot of cool things that we have uh, in the pipeline to kind of help people understand the type of, of text they're generating and the things that um, they'll ultimately be delivering. All right, awesome. Um, so we're going to move on to the Q&A section. I'm going to escape out of the play mode so that I can navigate the chat box here. And there we go. Um, just scrolling up to some of the earlier questions. So one of the first questions that came in is, and I guess Rob, it's probably the best one for you. Um, actually, I guess either of you can take it. If we have examples of NLG for SaaS product renewals, so uh, that particular use case, is that something that's come down, come by your desk yet, Robbie? Well, considering we are a SaaS company and we use lots of SaaS tools, it is definitely something that we've uh, talked about. Um, so, you know, again, I, I would recommend anyone that's interested in, in kind of what you've heard about today, automatedinsights.com. It talks about Wordsmith. You can, you know, request uh, a demo. We can get you hooked up. And uh, if you have a good underlying data source, I'm willing to bet that there's some interesting stories we can help you tell about the data. So next question is about moving from automated insights to actionable ones. Hillary, I'll post this to you because you did mention that uh, with the different approaches, there's in the heuristic example where the user comes in and uses his or her subject matter expertise to craft the template. One, somebody does really need to know, um, you know, have subject matter expertise in, in the given in the given topic at hand to know how to use the data and communicate insights effectively. Um, to what extent are, are, are new data methods sort of shifting the expertise from the user to the to the software? Uh, so to answer that question, um, I think what, what we do is make up for in the size and quality of the data, the specific um, work that the human person uh, writing the template would have done. But what I actually think this person asked is much more about what you do with the output of this kind of system. And so right now, all of these things we've demonstrated are, um, you know, sort of taking data and telling you what the data says, but it doesn't tell you what to do. And so it's quite possible that you could imagine a system that would recommend specific actions um, given the effect that those actions have had on similar, similar uh, performance stats in the past or in the future. But I, I really do urge you to think about this as one tool in a professional's toolbox. The goal here is not to replace people who make decisions. It is to give them information more effectively so that they can make those decisions and have a better understanding about um, why, how, where it comes from, and what might happen. So affiliated question. Robbie, I'll pass this over to you. Um, it reads, Wordsmith seems like a tool that can render a lot of clerical or admin reporting work below the API. What kind of trends has Automated Insights observed for companies using Wordsmith in internal clerical reporting of data and does it ultimately replace rank and file responsibilities? Yeah, so you know, ultimately, you know, I've been saying this for a couple of years now. Yeah, I think the future, you know, if if your job today is to, to analyze a data set and send out a report about the data set, that you know, your job is going to change in the future. It's going to you know rely on tools like Wordsmith to help you essentially be more scalable in that function. Um, and ultimately, I think that's a great thing because you know. Computers are much better at doing highly repetitive tasks, especially at scale, much better than people typically are. And so what we can do is take a lot of that, as this person referred to, a clerical reporting work, and, and you know, move that to software, where I think ideally it's, it's better suited anyway, and you know, have that person instead um, help configure and program the system to make sure that it's catching everything it should be you know, catching in terms of analysis, but then also focusing on higher value added things. Um, so ultimately, yeah, I do see that as a trend. It's something that started several years ago, and we're seeing it happen a lot more now. Um, you know, even in a good example of this is our Wordsmith for Marketing product, where we essentially automate the reporting process for digital agencies that are using Google Analytics and AdWords. 
um, and other systems like that. We can fully automate those reports out of Google Analytics so that the person doesn't have to spend hours every week going through uh, GA and trying to do that themselves. And the feedback we've gotten from that has been tremendous. People love that we can do that, so they're freed up to go do other things. There are so many questions. I, didn't, I just saw a ton more come in. Okay, um, question for Hillary. Fast Forward Labs, we tend to use Python in our search. Well, we actually use the tool that's best fit for purpose for the given project, but Python comes up a lot. Um, do we find ourselves using mostly existing libraries like SkyKit, NumPy, etc., or do we develop our own libraries? And um, basically, what are what are going to be the language and tool barriers in the future with the release of newer tools like TensorFlow and God, Microsoft just released a deep learning uh, open source tool as well? Yeah, so we are huge fans of open source and make use of open source. We use Python. It's our primary uh, research and development language. So we also use C, Go, or whatever the right tool for the job is. Um, Definitely. I'm, I'm really excited about the new stuff emerging in the open source community, but none of it does um, specifically this. And so while we do, in fact, use uh, toolkits like um, Scikit-Learn or, you know, might play around with an implementation of something in NLTK, the Natural Language Toolkit for Python, um, you might find that when you actually want to build something in production, those, uh, those tools are not quite up to the performance qualities and characteristics that you need, and so then we might rewrite something ourselves. Um, I also am a huge believer, if you're someone who's playing around with developing in this area and implementing an algorithm for yourself uh, in your own code at least one time, um, just so you really understand how it works, and that's a core part of our R&D philosophy here. Uh, so even if there is strong open source in an area, we will go through the process of, um, of writing it ourselves just to make sure we really understand it. So there's a question relating to the number of summaries that can be output from a given, uh, you know, given run of an NLG tool. I know in the approach that we took, we actually developed a scoring system where when we were um, cr crawling through the library of, of the, how many was it, 50,000 sentences, Hillary, that we'd collected? Um, no, it was somewhere around 80,000 documents, I think. Okay. But, um, but no, the, um, the, the algorithm we chose to use in our prototype is a generative algorithm. And so you give it as a parameter how long you want it to run. So you might say run for 30 seconds. And it will keep generating candidate text for that time. And then we, we have an arbitrary scoring function um, that we decided it seems to describe a high quality result. Um, and this is all explained fully in the report. This is just one option, though. Yeah, um, Robbie, and I know that uh, the newer version of Wordsmith also will present candidate summaries and then it's up to the end user to select which one they want. Is that accurate or how do you guys go about ranking the, the different um, options for the output? Yeah, so that's what we refer to as variability. Um, and so really it's up to the, um, you know, the author of the template to determine how much variability they want built in. You know, again, for some of our more complicated implementations, again, maybe the Yahoo is, is, is a good example. You know, we're generating millions of, of stories every single week, and if you happen to get one that sounds similar to the one you got last week, then the experience is ruined. And so, you know, I think one of the questions was, you know, for a given input, can you get different outputs? We absolutely have that in, in many implementations, just because the need for variability is so great. Um, so that's absolutely a, a lever that you can kind of toggle and play with, and we'll be providing more tools over time to help describe the extent of the variability in the narratives that you create so that we can tell you, you know, these were very similar or they were dissimilar in, in different ways. Uh, just to give somebody a heads up, as, you know, for a thousand stories, how similar were they? So, so let's, let's flip variability to refer not to the variability of the output, but the variability of the data that's input to generate the narrative. So there's a, a really good question on um, the effort that goes into maintaining Wordsmith narratives. So, Say we've got a data set that changes every morning, it might even come from a third party. Is there a great deal of manual manipulation that must take place with the data before the NLG process can, can occur? No, it's, it's you know, it, it, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but ultimately, at least right now, and this is what most of our clients are, are asking for, is a deterministic output. So there has to be, you know, some understanding of what the data looks like and what the boundary cases are, but obviously, you know, you can, you know, capture any of the sort of outliers uh, if you know those ahead of time. Um, what we haven't seen is, you know, all right, here's a data set, now just describe that data set. 
And the reason for that is because for any given data set, there's literally an infinite number of ways you could describe it. And most customers need some you know, a level of control over that message before they send it out. And so in most cases, people need to have a pretty good handle on what their data looks like in order to be able to really capture the different types of stories that could be produced. So there's a question here about the impact on SEO with automated contact and the ability to create copy that aligns with brand style. I'll take the lead and answer that because there's a lot of other ones that are out there. From our experience working with um, Automated Insights and some of the other vendors in this space, often the response is that um, it actually contributes to, it improves SEO because if you have a system that can automate and generate you know, moderate differences between the different um, product descriptions that, that, that one's using NLG to, to generate um, advertisements or product descriptions for, um, you can sort of get the key consistency to drive the SEO results you want to have, but also have a little bit of variability on content um, that is harder to achieve without automation. Um, there's some questions in there. Hillary, I'll pass it off to you. We have a startup that is um, using some of these generation capabilities to um, automatically suggest tweets from longer documents. Any other, have you seen any other inst um, instances of automation of Instagram, Twitter, and and uh, gosh, other social media oh, yeah. content. I mean, this is an area where I've been fiddling around and playing for years and years and years. Um, and th there's a lot of fun stuff you can do here, where you know you have an article that might be something you want to tweet, and you're trying to figure out, you know, what's the appropriate text to go with it, and what'll what'll be more successful. Um, yeah, it's a lot of fun to play with these problems. Um, I think there are even some products in the market that will do this as well. I know Buffer has this as a feature, and, and I think a few of the other social media products do it too. But it's also a really nice little problem if you want to get started as a developer fiddling with this stuff. Um, it's a really fun one to look at. Yeah, um, this is an area we actually, one of the first um, areas where you know I generated sort of the first bit of automated content, this is 2008, um, was for Twitter. And so now, you know, we do about a half million automated tweets a year for a variety of clients. Um, and then we moved on to Facebook, and so we were doing, um, you know, close to a million Facebook messages a year that were all automated. So it, it is sort of an interesting space to explore. There's a couple of questions in there about uh, scalability, flexibility, to use these systems for different languages, be that, you know, uh, Romance languages and Indo-European languages or for the branching far afield into Arabic and Mandarin and Japanese, et cetera. Um, actually, you know, Robbie, I don't, I don't even know the uh, linguistic flexibility of your product. Do you guys do you work in, in languages besides English? Yeah, we do, actually. You know, out of the gate, we support roughly 15 languages. Um, and, and fundamentally, I think that's the ultimate power for NLG is, you know, so what I thought about years ago was I'd love to be able to write a story in one language and then have it automatically generated in other languages. Now we're not quite there yet, but um, you know there's no reason why you know when you have sort of the fundamental text structured in a way, and you already have the data, which in many cases will be language neutral if it's just you know numbers. In other cases, it may not be, um, but it provides an opportunity so that you know instead of doing a fantasy football recap in just English for Yahoo, maybe we could also produce it in Spanish and um, you know a variety of other languages. And so Wordsmith already provides that capability today, and we'll be adding a lot more languages over time. All right, Hillary, last question for you. Just thinking about the effort that it would take for a data science team to get their, their data and their systems ready for an NLG project, what kind of timelines and efforts have you seen in your experience? Yeah, I mean, it, it really depends on whether this is something they're uh, developing as part of an existing system or whether they're planning to use another vendor. Um, and then that, that answer is also changing a lot. So if you'd asked me this question a year and a half ago, the answer would have been that you know, at a minimum, it would take six weeks to do an impl implementation with a, a vendor um, because there was so much customization that the system required, and all of these products obviously have come a huge way uh, in that time. In terms of building something uh, more from scratch, it really does take, uh, you know, a fair amount of dedicated effort from somebody with a, a bit of an algorithmic background and the ability to clean and manage a, a decent amount of data. Um, and then it also really, if you're thinking about it from that perspective, where I've seen people most fall down is actually not in the, the system design piece, but in the evaluating the quality of the output piece. 
Um, and so you have to be very thoughtful ahead of time around how you're going to test the success of your system. And, um, and there's still, honestly, a lot of hacking that goes on to make things work for any specific application. And so that's, that's a sizable project. It is not a trivial project. Okay, so we're at the hour. Um, if there's any ex residual questions, questions you guys still want to pose, um, the Robbie and Hillary's Twitter handles are there on the slide. You can post things to hashtag NLG webinar. You can reach us at contact at fastforwardlabs.com. Robbie, what's your uh, general outreach email at Automated Insights? Just Robbie at automatedinsights.com. Okay, great. And um, of course, final sales pitch before we go. There's a couple of handouts affiliated with the webinar that you can hopefully see on your um, your GoToWebinar control panel. One from Fast Forward Labs, one from one from um, Automated Insights. And we would love uh, her way of follow up. If you're interested in a demo of Wordsmith, reach out to Robbie at Robbie at AutomatedInsights.com. And if you'd like to hear more about our, learn more about NLG, you can get the full overview of the landscape, how this stuff works, who's, who's working on the projects at clients.fastforwardlabs.com. Actually, if you just go to fastforwardlabs.com, you'll see a banner at the top where you can go to the NLG page. And we hope you enjoyed your time, and thank you for coming. Take care. <laughs>